my name is Jess Posner. My pronouns are she and they, and I am the director of the Virtual Y at the YMCA of Central New York. I am a white woman in my 30s with asymmetrical brown hair. I am wearing glasses, a matching forest green top and sweater, and some handmade jewelry. The background behind me is a patterned blue and purple virtual background, which is covered in little YMCA logos. I am honored to welcome you to today's virtual lunch and learn allergy awareness for families and caregivers with Dr. Jeannie Lomas, um, who is with our friends at Well Now Allergy. We are meeting today on Zoom, and I would like to remind all of our guests to please keep your microphones muted unless you are invited to unmute. We will have time for question and answers following today's presentation, so please feel free to shoot those in the chat at any time, or at the end of the presentation, you can raise your hand and we can unmute and have a bit more of a casual conversation. We are recording today's event, as this recording will be lightly edited and posted to YouTube on our virtual Y platform. We have enabled automatic closed captioning, which you can turn on in your Zoom control menu under enabled, um, you can turn, sorry, I got lost in my little menu here. Um, we have enabled automatic closed captioning, which you can turn on in your Zoom control menu under captions. We encourage everyone to view today's program in presenter mode, which you can change in the upper right-hand corner of the view menu if you are joining on laptop or in the three dots or by swiping if you're joining on tablet or mobile. If you would like, you can also change the scale of the presentation on the video of the presenter view by sliding the little gray bar next to the presentation um, to each side. So if you see both myself and Dr. Lomas right now kind of small, identify the little gray bar and slide it side to side and you can make us a little bit bigger. In this Allergy Awareness for Families and Caregivers seminar, Dr. Lomas will help us to better understand common sources of indoor and outdoor allergens, identify symptoms of a life-threatening allergic reaction, and demonstrate how to treat it using an epinephrine auto-injector. The educational seminar may be particularly helpful to caregivers, families, educators, and others who have or work with individuals who may experience allergic reactions. As this is going to be recorded and posted on YouTube, please feel free to share this um, with anybody that might find it useful. Dr. Jeannie Lomas, DO, is a board certified pediatrician and allergist immunologist. She completed medical school at the LECOM in Erie, Pennsylvania, before moving to Rochester, New York for her pediatrics residency. She stayed at the University of Rochester Medical Center for fellowship training in allergy and immunology and remained on staff as faculty in Rochester until 2021, when she joined WellNow as the director for allergy and immunology. She is passionate about patient care, education, and community advocacy. In her clinical practice, Dr. Loma sees patients of all ages with diagnoses such as seasonal and environmental allergies, asthma, atopic dermatitis, also known as eczema, food allergies, and medication allergies. Her special interests include EOE, eosinophilic gastrointestinal disease, FPIES, and antibiotic stewardship. She has presented various allergy topics locally, regionally, and nationally. Dr. Lomas is also actively involved in clinical research through WellNow, where she oversees trials of patients having a variety of conditions, including COPD, asthma, and eczema. Well Now Allergy, a New York primary care PC, is an affiliate of Well Now Urgent Care, a growing provider of convenient, high quality allergy care with six allergy centers in New York, Ohio, and Indiana. Launched in 2021 and led by Dr. Jeannie Lomas, DO Well Now Allergy is on a mission to make expert allergist care from consultation to allergy testing and ongoing immunotherapy easy and convenient for patients of all ages. For more information, you can visit wellnow.com slash allergy. So without further ado, I now turn over the virtual stage to our Dr. Jeannie Lomas. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, well, thank you, Jess, so much for having me. And so um, thank you for that amazing introduction as well. I'm so excited to be talking to everybody and for your audience to be able to hear these important um, topics about allergies. So as Jess mentioned, Allergy Awareness for Families and Caregivers is the title of this presentation. She kind of already did my introduction, so I just 
The only other thing that I wanted to point out is kind of, even though I am practicing mostly seeing patients mostly in the Buffalo, New York area where I currently live, again, we do have offices and I'll go over later in the Rochester and the Syracuse areas. Um, and so the Liverpool office um, that I oversee uh, with amazing provider there as well uh, would be probably most proximal to the people that are watching and listening right now. And then just in the interest of making sure that I am not glitching, I'm going to turn off my video while I'm presenting the slides. And then when we go back to um, Q&As, I will return, resume my video for everybody. So the objectives, we're going to define allergy. We're going to list some common allergy triggers for all age groups and describe how allergies affect the human body and what symptoms might be caused by allergies. We're also going to kind of talk about the difference between acute allergic reactions or something called anaphylaxis, which is a life-threatening allergic reaction, and then some chronic diseases that um, allergies really do play a role in kind of helping to develop um, or present in people. And then describe how to identify anaphylaxis and how to treat it, including the use of an epinephrine auto injector. This is especially important, you know, if you are a caregiver of someone that has uh, life threatening allergies like food allergies. And then at the end, we'll kind of discuss how people can get tested for allergies and identify ways to prevent allergic reactions of all kinds when possible. So defining allergies, what is an allergy? So lots of people come into our offices and say, I think I have allergies, right? Um, but that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So the real technical and medical kind of definition is an exaggerated immune response. And you'll hear in my, you know, in my title as I'm board certified in allergy and immunology and just that I'm the director of allergy and immunology. The reason that allergies and immunology are so closely linked is because again, allergies Allergy is an exaggerated immune response. So basically, if you want to think of it as an overreaction of the immune system to something that typically is pretty harmless, you know, like pet dander, or pollen, or foods, um, where it just kind of overreacts and, and, um, and develops these symptoms in people. The other thing that allergies are is they're reproducible. So meaning if you have an allergy to a food or to an environmental allergen, Every time you're exposed, something should happen, right? It does not mean that the same symptoms will happen with each exposure, and it does not mean the severity of the symptoms will be the same. Sometimes they might be mild, sometimes they might be life threatening, um, but something should happen every, each and every time you are exposed to the allergen, especially if it's in large amounts. So this kind of plays into if people are thinking they might have food allergies, but they can tolerate, you know, let's say dairy most times, and then just sometimes they get an upset stomach. Again, that's probably not an allergy. We'll talk about that a little bit more um, later on. Contact with allergens can be through the skin, eyes, nose, lungs, mouth, or the stomach and GI tract. Again, it really has to be in contact with our body somehow. Sometimes that can be from breathing things in, especially things that uh, like pollens that are kind of floating around in the air um, or dander and things like that. Um, and then the statistics, so 40% of children and 30% of adults in the U.S. have at least one allergy. So it's a lot of us. So this is how allergens interact with our bodies. And so I'm a visual learner. And so I like to provide slides like this to kind of help everybody learn. And again, this is kind of more on an immune immunologic or an immune system level. So you think of these microscopic allergens that are floating around pollen, dust, dander, foods, um, and they have to come in contact, right? That's what I just told you with our skin, with our nose, our eyes, our mouth, um, our stomach or GI tract if we're swallowing them. And then what happens when they're ingested or when we come in contact with them is they stimulate our immune system, typically through certain white blood cells called lymphocytes. And these certain lymphocytes, specifically called plasma cells, produce specific antibodies. And now these antibodies are different than the antibodies we create, for example, after an infection or after we have a vaccine where they're protective. Those types of antibodies are protective. These antibodies are a different type of antibody. And what they do is they're very specific. They're called IgE antibodies or allergy antibodies. And they kind of stick 
to these allergy cells or mast cells that we have all over our body and lots of different organs and in our skin and, you know, all the different areas that allergies affect. And after they stick, what happens is when you're exposed again to those allergens, whatever they are, um, they can trigger those cells to produce symptoms in a person. So sneezing, itching, hives, whatever the symptoms are, to kind of depending on where the allergy cells get activated. So that's just kind of a breakdown of what allergies do to our bodies and how that happens. Now, this process doesn't happen very fast quickly. It typically happens over the course of months or years of exposure to these things, right? Um, we hear frequently in little children, you know, it wasn't the very first time they ate peanut or dairy. Maybe it was the second or third time. So it can happen over a long time. I have people coming in, you know, in their 50s and 60s that never had allergies their entire life. And um, and now they're popping up with seasonal allergies or new allergies. And so it really, there's a lot that we don't understand about why allergies develop and when they develop, but a lot of different factors play a role. Um, and that's things that we're still learning and trying to figure out. This I thought was interesting. So this was an online survey that was done in 2021, so pretty recently, of 2,000 American adults. I will say the caveat in here is they didn't report any of the demographics of the people that responded um, to the survey, so take that with a grain of salt. But the reason I wanted to show you this is because this is actually pretty representative of uh, the most common allergies. And so you'll see that pollen allergies are affecting, you know, almost half of the population, you know, a third to a half of the population in the U.S. Um, medication allergies with penicillin allergy being the most commonly reported um, uh, drug allergy or medication allergy. And then you'll see other things like uh, indoor allergens, like pet, um, food allergies a little bit less common, but still up there, insect allergies, so that those would be things like bees or stinging insects, um, latex allergy, which is still around, but it's less common than it used to be just because a lot of our medical procedures and things we use like gloves when we're working uh, have less, less latex or are latex free now, and then there are a variety of other allergies. So again, just a good representation of just how many people kind of around us have these specific allergies. The one caveat here again with the pen or with the drug allergy and a lot of people that are probably listening may have a penicillin allergy on their list. That's something that is very commonly overreported. So the common story is that, you know, my mom told me I had a rash as a kid with penicillin. Lots and lots and lots of people outgrow that. And so the statistic there is that 95% of people that had a mild reaction to penicillin or amoxicillin as a child uh, can actually tolerate it. So just kind of imploring you to go see an allergist for testing for that. Okay, getting into, again, some of the most common outdoor allergens. So we talked about pollen, and in the Northeast, pollen allergies typically follow a kind of a specific pattern. So tree pollen is out right now. It's, it's as soon as it starts to get warm. Um, so if you see that you're having itchy eyes or uh, uh, dry eyes kind of this time of year, that's probably the tree pollen. And it kind of peaks in the spring and kind of goes away in the early summer. Grass pollen is the late spring through the midsummer. So that tends to be kind of the end of the school year, beginning of the summer um, in this part of the country. And it correlates with when you see the cottonwoods or those fluffy white things flying around. If you're having a lot of allergies at that time, it actually probably isn't the cottonwoods. It's the fact that the grass is pollinating at the same time. And that's what we're breathing in but you can't see it. And so people see the cottonwoods and they assume that that's, be, that's what their symptoms are due to, but it's actually probably the grass pollen. And then weeds like ragweed, super common again in this area of the country, and that's late summer through early fall. So usually about mid-August through the first frost of the year. 
And then weather patterns and trends can affect the timing and the length of the pollen season. So you'll hear people say, oh, this is a really bad pollen season or it's a really long pollen season. And that can happen, um, especially with, you know, climate change and global warming kind of affecting how long and how stacked our seasons are. So when we get a late winter that kind of, you know, the frost kind of extends into March or April, then as soon as the um trees pollinate, it's kind of like the grass is ready to pollinate too. And so everything kind of hits you all at once. And so for people that have multiple allergies, the reason it may seem worse is because there are multiple allergens present instead of having kind of a seasonal variation. And then just uh, weather in general. So the wind itself is kind of what carries these pollens. And so when it's very windy, you might notice that your allergies are worse. Um, as opposed to obviously if there's a freeze or hard frost, then that can kind of dampen everything down um, and kill off a lot of the plants or the pollens. And then the uh, rain can affect it because it kind of weighs down the pollen. And so you might actually notice that your symptoms aren't as bad when there has been a rainstorm, although that typically comes with wind too. So it's, it's hard to say. And then something interesting that I hear about all the time because people say, you know, I think I'm allergic to flowers or like we talked about like the cottonwoods flying around. So flowering plants and trees are actually less likely to cause true allergies or an allergic reaction like we just talked about how it interacts with our immune system. And that's because their particles, they 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 reproduce in different ways, right? They have fruit or they have flowers and that pollen is larger and it's actually more difficult for us to inhale. Um, but if you do come in contact with those things, they can actually cause irritation of the eyes and the nose and the respiratory tract and cause very similar symptoms or symptoms that mimic allergy symptoms. So if you're having sneezing or um, itching after, you know, smelling some fresh plants or flowers that somebody has in their house. It's not that um, you can't, that it can't be a trigger for you. It absolutely can be a trigger, but it's sometimes not a true allergic reaction, which also should give you a little bit of peace of mind to think that it's probably not going to be something life-threatening just more annoying. And then outdoor molds can be a problem year round, but especially in the fall with the wet fallen leaves. So Christmas trees are actually a common culprit of this. So a lot of people will tell me, oh, I'm, I think I'm allergic to uh, pine trees because I have a problem every December if we get a real tree. But the actually the culprit there is actually the mold that grows on the bark of the trees. You bring it in the house into a nice warm house, you know, next to a roaring fire and you put it in a big pot of water. And so the mold spores really pr proliferate in that environment. And so if you've had issues with fresh trees in the past, it's actually probably a mold issue and not a pine tree issue. Indoor allergens, so dust mites are microscopic little critters. They feed off of our skin flakes and the dander that are shed by our pets. And then the allergen we're allergic to is actually in their feces, which is super gross. Um, but this is all happening on a microscopic level for the most part. And they live in the items that are difficult to clean, like our mattresses and our upholsteries, even stuffed animals for kids. So you can get um, encasement, uh, like covers that fully zip around your mattress and pillows. Uh, you want to wash and dry all your bedding at least once a week and same with stuffed toys. A tip or a trick there is you can actually freeze things that can't be washed. So maybe like a stuffed animal or something overnight and that does a good job of killing the dust mites as well. And then if you have the means to replace carpets with bare floors, like hardwood floors or tile or something like that, that can be helpful. Cockroach um, allergy is actually also pretty common. We test everyone for it and people are amazed when they are sensitive to cockroaches. Most frequently found in urban or city areas, older dwellings, public buildings. It's linked to severe asthma symptoms when you have a cockroach allergy. And then really it, um, for remediating cockroaches, you just want to make sure you're picking up food waste and any kind of garbage um, because that's what they typically live off of and exterminate areas if you have visible pests. For indoor allergies, uh, continued, so um, pets, 
So even short haired or non shedding animals can cause allergies. I know it's crazy, but it happens. <laughs> um, there's truly really no such thing as a truly completely hypoallergenic animal. Um, so the allergen is actually not only in their dander, but also in their saliva, urine and feces. And they can also track outdoor allergens indoors on their fur. So if they've been just playing outside in the grass and then they come inside, you know, they're going to bring all that grass allergen inside as well. So you want to try to vacuum and regularly, if you can try to bathe your pets regularly, this includes even cats, which I know are not always fond of water. Um, you want to try to keep pets out of the bedroom if you're allergic and off the furniture just to reduce the amount of allergen you're going to be breathing in all the time. Avoid contact again with the soil litter or wear masks and gloves when cleaning again because that allergen is in their um, urine as well and wash hands after contact with animals. If you don't, yourself don't have animals, but you know you go over to grandma's house and grandma has um, a bunch of animals and you're always symptomatic, you can consider kind of pre-treating yourself before you go over there and then consider a HEPA air purifier as well. So kind of going into common types of allergic disease and many people have these diagnoses. So allergic rhinitis is our medical term for hay fever or kind of environmental allergies that cause chronic nasal symptoms. Um, and this can be typically due to either indoor or outdoor allergens. Asthma, very, very common. Chronic lung disease typically presents in childhood, but can present as an adult as well. And many asthma patients have allergic triggers, especially children. So the statistic there is usually about 60% or more of children actually have allergic triggers for their asthma. For um, adult onset asthma, it might be a little bit less. And then atopic dermatitis is the fancy name for eczema. This is a chronic skin disease for which allergies um, typically play a role. And the way allergies play a role in eczema is more often, even though you can have allergic triggers for your eczema, like pets or things like that, more often it's actually the earlier you have eczema, so babies and, and toddlers that have eczema, it can kind of predispose them to developing allergies um, if it remains uncontrolled for too long. And that's something called the atopic march where kids start off with eczema and then maybe they get food allergies or environmental allergies, asthma, and kind of like um, kind of spirals as they get older. This is a nice just graphic to kind of to show you, you know, that all of these things tend to overlap. So if I am a person that has hay fever, seasonal allergies, um, I also might have asthma. Maybe I have chronic ear infections or eye allergy symptoms. Maybe I have sinus infections. And so most of the time, our patients that we see don't just have one single allergy or allergic disease, they have multiple. And so we have to ask about all of these. The same thing with something like eczema that I just told you about. So like a baby could um, start off with eczema, and then we want to make sure we kind of screen them for food allergies, um, contact dermatitis, which would be something like a metal allergy, like to jewelry or something like that. Again, very commonly happens with eczema because it's a skin allergy disease. And then they can go on to developing things like environmental allergies or allergic rhinitis and asthma as well. So who is at risk for developing allergies? Definitely people that have parents or siblings with allergies and your risk increases up to even 75% if both parents have allergies or any allergic disease. And even if that's mild, just, you know, mild seasonal allergies, a lot of times we'll, when I'm seeing a child with allergies, I'll ask if the parents have allergies and they'll say, nah. And I'm like, not even like seasonal allergies. And they'll say, yeah, a little bit of mild allergies. And um, because a lot of times the parents are just like, you know, I don't know where this all came from. But when you really dig, you find out that they do have allergies as well. And then having one or more allergic disease like eczema kind of predisposes you to other allergies and other allergic diseases. And then I, the reason I put question marks next to these environmental exposures, so there's a lot of science and research going into all of these things and how they play a role. So it's kind of that nature versus nurture, where some of it is pre-programmed and genetic and, you know, your, your risk there, but then it's also probably certain environmental exposures. Like we know, for example, tobacco smoke and having certain viruses, like viral illnesses as a young child or a baby can kind of predispose you to have asthma um, and the tobacco smoke even when it's secondhand um, 
your home environment, you know, what are you exposed to? What kind of community you live in? You know, is it a city? Is it a rural or a farming community? Um, even diet and cultural practices. This is, you know, what changed the feeding recommendations with the peanut um, allergies um, now back a number of years ago is because we were observing other cultures that fed their children, you know, highly allergenic foods very early on and that they had fewer allergies. And then um, occupational exposures as well. So if you're working with latex or chemicals, um, then you might be more disposed or predisposed to developing allergies to those. So allergy symptoms, many of you know these because you may have suffered to these, but really I just want to demonstrate that any organ system can be involved when you're having allergy symptoms. So I won't read all of these, but you'll see that itching is a very, very common symptom, not only with an acute or like a life-threatening allergic reaction, but also chronically in things like eczema, or if you have seasonal allergies where you have like itching of your eyes or your nose, your ears, um, and then the other thing that I want to point out here is that for an acute allergic reaction, you may have like vomiting and diarrhea, especially if it's a food reaction, but that that's typically pretty rare for chronic allergies, like if you have seasonal allergies or something like that, we don't typically see a lot of gastrointestinal symptoms. And then same thing with cardiovascular symptoms. So low blood pressure is actually the most worrisome sign of a, a, like an anaphylactic reaction, which we'll talk about um, shortly, but it's not something that we typically observe in kind of these chronic allergic diseases like asthma or eczema. So anaphylaxis. So when we're defining anaphylaxis, it's a serious, serious life-threatening um, or systemic whole body allergic reaction. The common triggers include food, mostly for children, medications in adults and foods, stinging insects more so in adults than children, and then also other things like latex can sometimes cause this. Um, and all er organ systems can be involved. So just like we talked about on that last slide. The treatment for anaphylaxis is an injection of epinephrine. Um, and if anybody tells you otherwise, you'll remember this slide because always, 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 always the treatment is epinephrine. So we'll talk about why that is. Epinephrine comes um, as an auto injector and you've probably seen some of these products uh, either at your schools or places of work or for yourself or your family members. Um, make sure that if you are prescribed one or if that you're caring for someone that has one that you know how to use it. So um, you can ask your healthcare provider if you're the patient or your child is the patient or a pharmacist to demonstrate. And then most of them actually come with training devices. So kind of um, what we call dummy devices that don't have any needles or medication in them so that you can practice or that you can teach caregivers how to use them. Um, there are a, plenty of great videos on YouTube as well that will walk you through it. So if you don't have access to a healthcare provider or a pharmacist um, and you still want to kind of learn about that, um, you can search that up as well. And so why, when we talked about epinephrine, 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 why not just give something like Benadryl and wait? And the reason is um, because the average time, as you can see on the right, to a respiratory or a cardiac arrest, um, so a very severe life-threatening reaction um, when you have an anaphylaxis um, reaction. For a food allergy, it's about 30 minutes. Venom, which would be like a bee sting, it's about 15 minutes. And then for some medication allergies, especially when like it's a hospital medication or something given like by an injection or an IV, it can be even less than that. And if you're giving someone an oral allergy medicine, it can take actually up to 30 minutes or even several hours to suppress all your symptoms. And if anaphylaxis can prevent progress within minutes, then that's typically what results in, um, in fatalities or death due to anaphylaxis is because somebody was not given epinephrine um, quickly enough. Um, it's given as an, an injection into the muscle, so typically in the lateral thigh or the kind of the meaty part of your thigh, the front or outer portion of your thigh where you can get to the muscle. Um, and epinephrine will suppress all the symptoms and all the different organ symptoms um, 
uh, organ areas that get affected in an allergic reaction within minutes. It is actually okay to give both epinephrine and something like Benadryl, like an oral allergy medicine together. So even if somebody has taken Benadryl already, it's not, you're never going to overdose them. They're two different medications. So you can absolutely give the epinephrine as well. Um, and a second dose of epinephrine may be needed. So you'll see sometimes that um, a child has a two pack, or um, if you're somewhere that's more remote, like camping or something like that, and you're waiting for 911 or emergency medical services to arrive, just know that you might need to give a second dose um, if you're waiting, because it will wear off probably within five to 10 minutes. This is a resource and I, on my last slide, I'll kind of share with you all the uh, resources as well, but it's from Food Allergy Research and Education or foodallergy.org. And so those of you that are teachers or care, um, daycare providers may have seen these for your um for your students. And it just is a really great resource of on this action plan, kind of what to do. So I, as an allergist, fill this out for my patients once a year, typically when they're, when they go to school or they're attending summer camps or things like that, but it's very, very self-explanatory about, you know, what the symptoms are, where you would give epinephrine versus what symptoms you might just give an antihistamine, um, like Zyrtec or Benadryl. Now, um, any to my general rule for my patients, if, if there's more than one thing going on, um, then you're probably going to err on the side of giving epinephrine. Or if there's ever any compromise of breathing or, again, blood pressure or anything like that. But typically, you don't want to wait for it to get that fast. Now, if somebody's just a little bit itchy or maybe has a, a like one or two hives but is talking and speaking normally and breathing normally, then you can probably try to give an antihistamine and just see how they how it um, how it goes. But if it's progressing or there's more than one thing going on, like maybe they threw up and they have hives, then it's already, that's anaphylaxis. And so you're um, just going to err on giving the injection. The other nice thing about the FAIR action plan is on the back, it actually goes over how to use each of the different um, devices. Now you don't want to be reading those, you know, you want to be comfortable with them, but in the case, in case of an emergency, if you really, you know, if there's any confusion, you can always turn it over and look at it right there. And then at the bottom, it also has room for emergency contract um, contacts, um, including, you know, physicians, parents, um, other uh, caregivers and things like that. Um, and then safety informa information. So remember when you're using these auto injectors, you never want to kind of put your thought. It's not like a clicky, like a pen. There's nothing on it that you'll have to click. It's actually the pressure of it into your thigh or into the person's thigh that will automatically um, inject the needle, uh, which is typically like spring loaded, um, and it will go into the, into the muscle. So, uh, you just typically on all of these, there's some sort of a case or a safety that you'll have to pull off. And then you can just, um, push it right into the area that, um, that you're trying to treat on the person. So that uh, mid outer thigh, and again, get comfortable with it, use it, when you don't need it so that when you do need it or when you do need to give it, there's no thought about how to use it. So how we test and treat for allergies, obviously there are tons of over-the-counter options now, um, eye drops, nasal sprays, and then um, oral tablets and liquids for children or people that can't swallow pills. Um, lots of environmental measures. We kind of went over some of these already for things like dust mites and pets, um, but even for pollens, again, trying to keep the window closed during high pollen seasons, um, using a dehumidifier in damp areas to protect against dust mites and molds. Um, and then if you've kind of exhausted those options, you can definitely see your primary care provider or pediatrician for um, other options like prescription options or referral to a specialist, including an allergist. They can also sometimes do some blood testing or some labs to try to identify some allergic triggers. 
And then if you do end up coming to see an allergist, then we have also those same prescription options. But in addition, I highlighted here um, that we do something called allergy immunotherapy. So those are allergy shots, um, which people have heard about because really they've been around for a hundred years or longer. And then there are some allergy tablets. Um, and the reason I highlighted this is because this is the only thing that is potentially curative for your allergies. So all these other things um, like the tablets and the nasal sprays and um, eye drops just kind of put a band-aid on the symptoms. But if you're really looking to kind of try to increase your tolerance to things like your pets and the pollens and, hey, I'm just sick of being sick, all these um, getting all these sinus infections year after year, every spring, um, then the best chance at getting rid of your allergies or really, um, you know, making a big difference over time is something like allergy shots. And then we also offer things like the injectable medications. A lot of you have probably seen these advertised on TV. They're um, these things called biologics now where they specifically target allergy cells. These are different than immunotherapy because it doesn't help you develop your own tolerance to allergies over time. It just treats your asthma or your eczema with a specific like injectable medication. And then we typically will do um, a variety of testing to try to identify allergic triggers. We can do spirometry, which is a breathing test for allergies. Um, patch testing, which is more for like contact dermatitis, like to metals and things like that. But the way that we test for allergies, typically like foods and environmental allergies is something called skin prick testing. Um, so I show you these devices just so that you can see that it's not as barbaric. So uh, frequently when I'm seeing a kid, the parents will, or the grandparents will say, oh, I had that done and they stuck a million needles in my back. It was horrible. And then we show them what we're doing for the child and they're like, oh, that's like not bad at all. So typically the devices we use nowadays are plastic um, and they're specifically designed to kind of promote a skin response without causing too much pain. Um, this is another one that's very common. It has like a multi-test. And then you can see underneath here, that's kind of the response you'll get with a positive um, skin test where you get like a little hive or a little swelling in that area. Um, and then sometimes we need to do the needles, which is called intradermals, but again, not doing dozens and dozens of them. Sometimes we'll just do that to, as a double check, you know, make sure you're not allergic to dog or cat if the prick testing is negative. And then again, I, so I uh, talked about the locations that Well Now Allergy has in New York State. So we have two here in the Buffalo area, one in the Rochester area, and then one in Syracuse and Liverpool. And so um, I just kind of highlighted these for you guys so that you have the information there. Uh, and the interesting thing or the great Part about being part of Well Now is that you can actually book your appointment online as well. Um, and then our offices will give you a call kind of to follow up on that. That is the end of my slides. I wanted to just thank everybody for their participation and I'll leave these up in case anybody wants information on um, any of the websites or the resources that I used for my slides today. And turn my video back on. Thank you so much, Dr. Lomas. That was so informative. Um, oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I mean, I'm like kind of a nerd, so I really enjoy learning. Um, and I feel like as a person who uh, has allergies, <laughs> um, I really learned a lot. So I just really wanted to thank you so much for- Absolutely. Um, this like really accessible, informative, um, and also kind of entertaining, uh, you know, and really engaging presentation. So I'm really grateful uh, for this because I think that it's going to be um, really useful for a lot of folks within our community. And I look forward to sharing it out more widely. So thank you for sharing your um, knowledge with us. You are so welcome. I love teaching and just kind of educating everybody. Um, especially because there's so many things that we can do for people or people can do for themselves. And so I always tell my patients, like, I don't want you to suffer. <laughs> so don't be out there just muddling through when, you know, we can help you. So. Well, thank you for that. I see that we already have a question from our friend, Valerie. Valerie, if you'd like to unmute um, and ask your question, you're welcome to do so. Hi there. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah. 
Excellent. Um, my son was diagnosed with possible possible F pies um, probably about six years ago. And I did see that you, you know, have a special interest in F pies. Um, at the time that he he had two separate uh, harsh reactions to shrimp uh, with extreme vomiting and he had gone to the pediatrician who then sent him to an allergist and he had all the classic testing but they said that you know that was not uh, anything that could be helped with epinephrine they said that they suspected f pies but there was not a definitive test back then i'm kind of wondering if anything has changed in these past few years and now there is a definitive test for that and then um you know yeah your your experience with whether people outgrow those or uh whatever you might have to say as an expert <laughs> absolutely that's a great question and yeah so f pies for those of you that have not heard of it is the short term for food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome and now you know why we call it f pies um, it is a less common food allergy, so it is not an EpiPen type of a food allergy, as Valerie just shared, um, but uh, it does tend to come up in infancy or early toddlerhood to a variety of things. Now, how old is your son now, you said? Uh, he's now 12. I think he's okay. about six when he was diagnosed, and he had been eating shrimp, you know, pretty much since he was two, and right. with no so problem, it just came on. <laughs> So there's good news, bad here, news here. So there is no definitive test. Um, your whoever had seen you initially is correct, and it's still the case that um, the skin testing that we do, which obviously we still will do a lot of times, because sometimes people can have both, like a, an epipen type of an allergy and an FPIs type of a reaction. Um, but it there is no more definitive testing. But the great news is is that we have a lot of data showing that kids outgrow those um, reactions. And so my advice typically is if you haven't seen an allergist lately, go and get retested just to make sure something in that time period where you have been avoiding hasn't popped up. And because there is a small chance that sometimes it can turn into a more life-threatening or an EpiPen type of reaction. So typically what I'll do is I'll repeat the skin testing. And if that's negative, we'll do a challenge sometimes in the office um, to reintroduce if there's been no accidental exposures in the last few years. Now, the caveat to that is shellfish is one of the ones that does pop up sometimes in older childhood and adulthood, and we know less about how it out, how it's outgrown. But I will say that I was at an, the National Allergy Conference um, just about a month ago, and they were actually collecting even more and more data on it and showing that even sometimes adults outgrow their shellfish F pies if it's been long enough. So I would say the fact that it's now been six years, um, I, it's probably reasonable to get reevaluated and then see if he could reintroduce it. Fingers crossed for you guys, for sure. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Lomas, for that. Um, and for Valerie for the great question. It's a, what a great opportunity to learn a little bit more. So thank you for sharing. Um, we have another question in the chat from our friend David who writes, I have seasonal allergies, anything green, very sensitive skin, a sensitive stomach, sensitivity to some food, um, aller allergic to some animals as well. My arm also swells up after like a yellow jacket sting. What is the likelihood that my three month old son will have all of these issues? Good, good question. And so that's, again, that nature versus nurture. So it kind of also depends on if the other parent is allergic. So I kind of threw out that statistic. So if one or one parent has allergies, then the likelihood of for your child to have allergies is around 30 to 40%, but that goes up to 75% if both parents have allergies. Now the type of allergies don't really matter. And so the way I will frequently explain it to parents is like, the tendency to be allergic to something is what's inherited. So kind of your overall predisposition to have allergies is the thing that you inherit. The specific allergies, like whether you're going to be allergic to peanuts or penicillin or pollen or whatever, is all based on our exposures. And that's all still what the medicine side of things and research is trying to figure out. You know, is there some 
you know, great combination of exposures in early life that can kind of prevent certain allergies. Um, so I would say going, so I can't give you a very likely, the likelihood that your child is going to be allergic to something is pretty high, but there are things that we can do to prevent the more life-threatening like allergies, even like food allergies. And so what I would say is if your son has already eczema, treat it early and treat it aggressively because we know that kind of restoring that skin barrier can prevent progression to other allergic diseases and kind of help prevent sensitization to um, different things like foods and environmental allergens. And then just kind of um, early introduction of those high risk foods. So I know it seems crazy, but again, our teaching, this is where I think I'm also a nerd and science is super cool. We were telling people for years and years, don't feed your, feed your kid peanuts until they're three and don't feed them dairy until they're one and all this stuff. And then we, again, observed other cultures and what they were doing and kind of rolled it back and said, actually, it's probably better if we do reintroduce. Now, if they, if your baby is to have some sort of an allergic reaction to a food, then that would be prompt referral to an allergist so that we could do testing. Um, but the guidelines are actually now right at, at like four to six months of age to introduce things like peanut in the form of, you know, you can put a little bit of peanut butter in their oatmeal, like their infant oatmeal or something in an age appropriate way. So obviously you're not feeding them things like whole nuts. So they're not choking but doing it in an age appropriate way and your pediatrician should be able to help with that. There's also resources on the, um, the food allergy research and education page that I have up here, this foodallergy.org that can help with early introduction, you know, little finger foods like scrambled eggs, um, yogurt for dairy and things like that. And try to just expose them to as much as you can, honestly. But if they do have any symptoms of an allergic disease, you kind of also want to treat those as early as you can. Um, the other thing that he brings up is uh, the pollen allergies and the foods and things like that. And that's something that I didn't go into in this presentation, but something worth mentioning. Um, I think a lot of my, so a, a less common food allergy, but actually more common to develop as an older child or an adult is something called pollen food allergy syndrome or oral allergy syndrome, where when you're eating certain fresh fruits, vegetables, even some whole nuts or raw nuts, um, you kind of get an itchy mouth or an itchy tongue. And that's because like those are plants, right? And so I'll use the example of birch tree and apples are kind of from the same plant family. And so some people get an itchy mouth when they're eating a fresh apple. Um, so there are things that that we can do and again kind of um, test for and those tend not to be life-threatening food allergies but um, sometimes they can be but if you're starting to notice as an adult like hey uh, all of a sudden like it commonly happens like people are trying to do the right thing and be healthy and eating all these fresh fruits and vegetables and then they're noticing oh wow I'm getting like all these allergy symptoms um, and you're not crazy it's because they're all plants <laughs> um, so my phrase that I use with my patients is like natural and organic and um, is great, but um, my patients are also allergic to nature, right? So you kind of have to be a little bit careful. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't want you to eat fresh fruits and vegetables, but again, there are things that we can do like, you know, washing them and peeling them that can kind of reduce some of those symptoms. And, and the natural and organic stuff goes into even things that you're using topically on your skin. So it's a big fad to kind of have lots of different plant oils or even food oils mixed into our personal care products, our cosmetics and our lotions and soaps and things like that because it makes it smell good and feel good. But again, if you're allergic to plants and you're rubbing plant oils or essential oils all over your body, you could definitely have an allergic reaction and I've seen it. So you just have to be really careful with that stuff. Again, for most people, it's going to be totally fine. But for my patients who are allergic to, you know, everything that is alive, you just kind of have to be careful with that. So that I usually recommend, especially for my eczema patients using just like very plain, plain, plain um, products, not with like lots of added things in them, because the more ingredients in them, the more you can actually become allergic to the products as well. Um, a common one there is like ragweed is in the same family as chamomile. So I've had people that have reactions to chamomile because they have a really bad ragweed allergy.
Wow. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, David put a little follow-up information in the chat that I'll read out for everybody, um, which is that his wife is a warrior goddess and not really allergic to anything. So <laughs> well for his son, um, but they'll be vigilant and proactive should anything come up. And also just uh, thank you for uh, helping diagnose his fresh fruit and raw nut allergy that he also has. So I kind of figured I could, I could read between the lines there. So <laughs> yeah, I have like a, just a kind of a short follow-up question to that. And then we also have um, another question from our friend, Mary Jo in the chat. So my, um, I guess my follow-up to that question in terms of thinking about some of those living things that uh, might cause that are allergies. You also, in the beginning of the presentation mentioned that, um, for example, like if you eat dairy some times and it causes distress, but it's not an allergy. Can you like just talk a little bit more about like what those differences are and how you might know how to discern between one thing and another? Yes. So important. It's such a great question because we do get a lot of people that kind of come in for um, chronic symptoms, but maybe they're not totally indicative of allergies, you know, and, and they really want to be tested and it's, uh, we have to have these conversations all the time. So especially when your symptoms are more like um, gastrointestinal, right? So you're getting upset stomach or bloating or gassiness and things like that. Again, absolutely could be a sensitivity to a food or an intolerance to a food. You've heard about things like lactose intolerance, obviously super common. Um, the problem is with seeing an allergist, our testing, so that skin testing that I talked about, or even the blood tests that we do, are really looking for that antibody, that allergy antibody. And so if it's not a true allergic um, reaction, then it's going to be negative anyways. And so what I tell people is like, I could test you to a hundred foods. I don't usually do that, but even if it's negative, it's actually not going to give us the information that we want. And so I know it's not what people like to hear because they like to come to me and say, just tell me what I'm allergic to so that when I, can, I avoid it, all my symptoms will go away and I never have an upset stomach anymore and, and all these symptoms. And it's just not that cut and dry. So for those people, I typically um, will recommend looking into things like a low FODMAP diet, which is kind of low in some of the natural sugars that kind of can predispose people to these chronic GI symptoms. And then also potentially even seeing a gastroenterologist, which, which is like a stomach specialist. Um, again, if you have lots of seasonal environmental allergies or you're having more acute reactions to foods like swelling and itching, to, like that's definitely within our wheelhouse and we can, we can diagnose that. But I just feel bad when people come in with more um, sensitivity or intolerance symptoms and not true allergy symptoms. And then I kind of say, listen, I don't think that testing is going to help you. Um, usually those patients leave still pretty happy because we have a plan for them, but um, it's actually a great question to ask. So again, those symptoms that I put up earlier with kind of more of like the itching and the sneezing and the more like vomiting, certainly if you're having like vomiting every time you eat a certain food. And again, it's going to be reproducible. So the, the people that come into me that say like, I don't know, I do have like stomach upset and bloating and, and diarrhea and stuff like that, but I can't really pinpoint a food. I usually tell them that it's probably not a food allergy because most people that have food allergies, they come in already knowing like every time I eat shrimp, I break out in hives or every time I have, you know, cashews, my lips swell up. And so it's typically when it's an allergy, it's clear to you before it's going to be clear to me when it's, when there's no definite pattern or it's really hard to figure out, then it's probably more of a sensitivity or even something else going on with your gut where, you know, a, a GI doctor would be more helpful for that. So yes, and thank you for asking it. What's the onset for like an allergic reaction? versus like, I like stomach upset, right? So like, let's say you had um, food, you know, for dinner and then, you know, would the allergic reaction happen really quickly versus like you have an upset stomach the next morning? Yes. So again, there's going to be kind of exceptions to the rule, but for the most, most food reactions will happen within 30 minutes or at least within 60 minutes of eating the food. And I would say a life-threatening allergic reaction is almost always going to be within 30 minutes. You know, usually people tell me I I'm not even done with a meal and I felt my lips were swelling or my throat was itching or something like that. Um, so the life-threatening or the more worrisome food reactions are going to be pretty immediate. Um, and that's just the way our body processes um, that it's a kind of a quick reaction. 
Um, if it is more of an intolerance, it could be hours or even days later. Something like food poisoning will tend to happen hours later or maybe the next morning or the night of. Um, and you should have kind of, you know, pretty severe symptoms that go away. Now, the what um, our a previous question was about F pies. That's a little bit different because again, it's not mediated by that same allergy antibody. And so the babies or the kids that have that F pies reaction, that actually is delayed as well. But again, not life threatening. It's like delayed vomiting. So um, you can kind of be safe to say that if it didn't happen immediately, that the symptoms are probably not life-threatening. Again, some exceptions to that rule, um, but a life-threatening allergy food or allergic reaction is typically going to happen within the first, you know, 30 to 60 minutes. If it's happening hours or days later, then it's definitely not life-threatening and um, it may not even be allergy at all. Thank you so much for that clarity. We have a question from our friend, Mary Jo, who asks, do you need a referral to go to WellNow Allergy? Good question. So you actually don't. Uh, again, there's exceptions to the rule. Some insurances do require it. But usually what happens is even if, you, if you're not sure and you plug yourself in and schedule yourself, our team will reach out to you and say like, hey, we need a, we need a referral from your primary. Um, and either you can work on that or our office can kind of reach out to the primary as well. Um, if you don't have a primary, then sometimes that's a little bit harder. Um, but I would say the vast majority, probably like 85 to 90 percent of insurances uh, do not require a referral. And especially for that Liverpool office out by you guys, um, I would say pretty much all of the major insurances participate with us there. So, but if you have any questions, you can always call. Um, when you book online, it'll ask you to put in your insurance, um, just the the payer, um, like the plan or, you know, who the carrier is. And then we can always reach out to you if there's any questions. All right, thank you so much. Um, and I just have one final question. You know, I, um, you know, anecdotally recently have heard that there's been an uptick in asthma or potential other kind of sensitivities as a result of COVID infection. And so I was wondering if um, you have any insight into that, or if there are other kinds of um, illnesses or diseases or things like that, that, um, you know, have, carry a high likelihood of potentially increasing allergy sensitivity. Yeah, great question. So even prior to COVID, allergic disease was on the rise, right? So lots and lots and lots of people developing allergic disease, also autoimmune disease. So if you think back to like the immune system, um, and that comes back to something called the hygiene hypothesis, where as we kind of got cleaner um, and having less infections as a society, so it's great because, you know, kids aren't dying of meningitis and people aren't dying of pneumonias anymore, um, but our immune systems are getting a little bored. And so um, they're finding other things to target like foods or, you know, our own body cells in the case of autoimmune disease. Now, what COVID did, it was really interesting because we have lots of data that show that people that had asthma prior to COVID actually did fine with COVID. And we don't know if that is something about them or if it was the meds that they were on that these kind of maintenance asthma meds protected them when they had COVID. They were less likely to be hospitalized and need oxygen and die from COVID if you had asthma, which was something totally crazy to us because viral infections trigger asthma, right? We see that with RSV and flu and things like that. But now what we're noticing post COVID is that there is a bunch of uh, like adult onset asthma. So people that didn't have asthma, that after they had COVID, it changed something about their immune system or their lungs. And now they have kind of chronic symptoms like a post COVID asthma picture. Um, and then I've seen the same thing with allergies as well. I've seen people that said, I never had allergies my whole life. And then I had COVID and I couldn't smell. And now I'm like chronically congested. And then I test them and they have all these allergies. So viruses are super tricky. COVID is obviously one of the trickiest ones and kind of always evolving. And so I think it's just playing a role in our immune system and kind of turning on switches that we didn't know were there. Now, certainly that was the case with other viruses. So we have data for things like RSV, like I talked about, and even like um, mononucleosis, like EBV, that can kind of show, you know, if you have the tendency to develop some of these diseases, and then you get infected with that virus, again, kind of turning on a switch in your um, 
in your system. The other thing that it does is it kind of changes the lining of you know, if you, if you have inflammation in the lining of your nose and your lungs and things like that, it changes how that, that interacts with things like allergens. And so it may be leaving us more susceptible that way to kind of um, develop allergies and, and things like that, that way. So definitely causes a lot of inflammation, definitely causes um, in certain people, you know, this predisposition, we still don't know a lot about it, but it's just really the reason why we're still trying to learn and just kind of make sure that even in this world where we're getting back to, you know, lots of our regular normal activities, we're still, you know, hand washing and doing all the things to kind of prevent um, getting sick for sure. Um, I just said it recently, all during COVID when everybody was masked and all the kids were masked and stuff like that, I barely saw any people have asthma exacerbations. And now that we're all unmasked and back to doing our normal things, which is great. And I'm excited about we're just seeing people pour back in with, you know, viruses and colds and asthma exacerbations and things like that. So kind of getting back to normal life. Um, so just keep remembering all those good hygiene things. And don't be afraid that if you are like sick or somebody is sick around you, don't be afraid to wear a mask if you um, don't want to get sick <laughs> either. <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you for that. Um, thanks for that information. You know, there's just, you know, I wanted to ask it because there's so much that is constantly changing and it's just like really hard to, you know, filter some of the things that you hear with all the information that is and isn't flowing publicly anymore. So I just wanted to thank you um, specifically for answering that so candidly and with, you know, backup from, um, you yeah. know, research and things that you've seen. And if a- you have concerns about asthma or chronic kind of respiratory symptoms, even post COVID and you're not sure, even if you don't think you have allergies, you can absolutely come to see us because like I said we do spirometry which is like the breathing test where it can kind of give us a better look at how well your lungs are functioning and tell you like do you really have asthma do you not have asthma um so don't be afraid to schedule it with us even if it's just for that all right well thank you so much Dr. Lomas is there um we're a little over time um so you know we really got into it so I just wanted to thank you and everybody who joined us for today for this really informative and educational um engagement so thank you so much for your expertise and for your um just teaching style which is so generous and warm so thank you for that um is there anything that you'd like to leave us with in terms of like final thoughts or anything that you want to make sure that we leave here with Yeah, I don't think so. The only thing that I would say is the most of the time when I'm seeing patients um, in clinic, they are, are saying, I wish I had found you guys sooner, right? And so just don't be afraid to ask either your pediatrician or your primary care, like, hey, what do you think about seeing an allergist or even just scheduling on your own? Um, It can't hurt. Um, Again, some of these things, the sooner you start them, the better, and it can kind of lead to Um, less progression of symptoms. So trust your gut and don't be afraid to reach out for sure. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lomas. Um, Thank you everyone who joined us here today and everyone who's watching online. Um, We really appreciate you and we hope to see you again soon. All right.